So it's lovely to be here today. Um, ha happy half term, if that affects you. It certainly affects us, we're teachers. So um, it's a lovely bright morning as well. So hopefully we're going to have some nice October sun for half term. So I'm Laura Mears, as um, Gareth just said. I occasionally speak here. And um, so I move my mic a bit. Um, I'm a full-time mum now. I was a teacher for 10 years. And um, I've got Gilbert, who's four, and Laurie, who's two. So I'm working quite hard with them at trying to shape their character and bring them up um, in the uh, ways of God. But um, one of my pas passions and big calls is to share the message, to share the message of the gospel. So that's what I've been asked to speak on today. And the first question I want to ask is, what is our message? I've been asked to speak about being a messenger of the gospel. But what is our message what is the gospel? came across a little article not long ago in the Times, and it was by a book, it was from a book by Roger Mortimer called Dear Lupin. I don't know whether anyone remembers that book. It's quite an old book. But um, it's a series of letters where a father writes to his wayward son, and he's writing him advice, and he's always trying to turn this guy around. And one of his letters reads, Have you considered the church? There's much to be said for the quiet life of a country curate, Fortunately, in the Church of England, an ordained priest is not committed to any but the vaguest of beliefs. <laughs> it really just stood out a mile. And I was thinking, what does he mean? Well, I wonder if we asked our friends, what do you think I believe, what they would say? And I was just making a list, a little brainstorm of things that my friends have said that they think I believe, or things that I think they believe. I think they believe that our message is, God loves you. I think they, I believe that their message is, they, I think they think my message is Christianity can make your life better, or that church is a place to find community, or that we should respect each other, or be kind, or live ethically. I imagine that they would be some of the things they would come out with if I asked them what I believe. And they're all truths or half-truths, aren't they? And some of them are really good things, but they're more like the theme of an infant school assembly than the pithy, simple truth. We need to hear the gospel, the good news, the key message of Christianity, the kernel of power. So what is it? What is the key message? And maybe you're sitting there and you don't actually know. Or maybe you know, but it's buried somewhere deep down. That's the theme of today's talk. It's the same message that Christianity has always had. Over 2,000 years, we need salvation. We need salvation. In the Greek, salvation is translated as sozo, which means to rescue from danger, illness, or into eternity. To rescue from eternal damnation. Eternal damnation. This means that without Jesus, we are heading for death and eternal separation from God. But what he did has saved us from that fate. And we need that salvation more than anything else. More than finding ourselves. More than finding peace. More than finding a community. More than being healed. More than having our lives beautified or bettered. We need salvation more than anything else. So we're going to look at the reading today, which is going to help us how to communicate this amazing message on our front lines. And the reading is from 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 13, if you're following it in your Bibles or on your phones, wherever you've got scripture. There's some Bibles at the front here. Please do come and help yourself. We're going to be in this passage for the next 20 minutes. Now, who will want to harm you? If you are eager to do good. But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. 
Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. And on to verse 22. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. So point number one from this talk, more than anything else, God wants people to be saved. God wants people to be saved. Did you see that in verse 18? This is how they're saved. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. I just love that translation. He died to bring you safely home to God. Now, I don't know whether you can remember life before you were saved. Can you remember that feeling of not being home? My mate Mark remembers. Uh, One or two of you may have met Mark. Um, He pops over at New Wine quite often to uh, where we're camping. There might be a photo of him coming up. Um, He goes to my sister's church in Liverpool. So um, I'm going to share his story, and I might slip slightly into Scouse, as I do so. That's where I'm from originally. And it just doesn't sound right if I'm using Mark's words not to have a a scouse scouse tinge. (laughs) So here's his story in his own words. I grew up around alcohol and drugs, and I heard a lot of fighting and arguing. And I'd be in my room, and when it went quiet, I knew what fear was. I've been anxious most of my life. I would walk around and other people looked happy, but I never had that. I was always looking for something and I found some comfort in drugs and drink. I found a relationship and I thought that was it, but it broke down after 18 months. I was in a really lonely place. I had a flat and I remember looking out of the window at the moon and I thought, if I lived up there, I couldn't be more cut off from the world. But then drugs and drink finally got a grip and I went into rehab. There I learned about surrendering to a higher power. I didn't just want a higher power, I wanted God. So I asked them to put me in touch with a church and they did. I walked in and they shared a Bible passage that started with, my child, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. I went round the church telling everyone that God was real. He had spoken to me. He'd called me my child. That was Mark's story. He's now leading a Celebrate Recovery program and he's been dry for five years. Absolutely fab guy. Just talking about not feeling at home in the world, but finding a home in God. And there are people all around us, aren't there, who aren't home. Just think for a minute about your family, about your workplace, on your street, where you go for coffee regularly, people in the park where you walk the dog. These are people God wants to love and he wants to save. People who aren't home. People know they aren't home, don't they? Um, We only have to open the papers or watch the news to see that people are screaming out, I'm not home, I'm looking for a home, I'm lost. How do I get home? Where can I find a place where there's a fire and food and a welcome? And not just a temporary home either, but a place where, where one's soul can find rest. That's what peace actually means. Peace, I think it's beautiful, means my soul sits down. A place where your soul can sit down. That's what people are searching for, isn't it? People are lost. Only forgiveness does that. Only Jesus' salvation can do that. Not denying our responsibility or hiding our shame or making idols of temporal worldly things. Only facing the shame we all carry and having it dealt with. Verse 18 again. Can we just have that back? Having it dealt with 
once for all time. Only having it dealt with once for all time will bring us safely home to God. And only living a new life, a life raised in the spirit, can make sense of this world with all its pain, questions and longings. God is calling us home. I've just finished reading a brilliant book by a guy called Rahil Patel, and it's called Found by Love. And uh, this guy spent 20 years in orange robes as a Hindu priest, and he studied and he meditated, and he did all of the Hindu practices, and he was making his way up and up the ranks, and he was super close to Guruji. And Guruji in his Hindu sect is the incarnation of God. And it's through Guruji that that Hindus in that particular sect believe that they can make it to God. But this wonderful guy, Rahil, he just knew that he wasn't experiencing that peace that he was supposed to be guiding others to experience. In his heart, he felt an emptiness. And he describes this voice. He says it was in his left ear. And this voice was just nagging him. It was speaking truth. It was calling him out, calling him away. And the emptiness that he felt drove him to the extreme of leaving the Hindu sect altogether after 20 years there. And he was left in London, penniless, and totally robbed of his identity. But one morning, he walked into a church on Onslow Square. And here's what he says. As I stepped through the doors, suddenly a blanket of incredible peace fell on me. A peace I had never known. A peace I'd worked so hard for but could never actually find. A peace that had no explanation behind it. And in those few seconds, that same silent voice in my left ear, like years before, spoke, gentle and honest as ever, your home. Now that voice is speaking not just to Rahil and not just to you. That voice is speaking to everyone on earth. God is the one taking initiative. So God wants people to be saved. But God saves people, not us. And that's a really important truth for people like me who want to share the gospel so passionately. It's not me. It's not us. If you're worried and anxious about sharing the gospel, that's good news today. God is taking the initiative, not us. And the reason it's God who saves people is that we aren't the surviving representatives of a dead saviour or a dead leader. We don't need to spread the word in the same way as as people who are members of a sect when that sect leader has died need to spread the word. Jesus is alive. He's doing it. Look at verse 22. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honour next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. And guess what? That authority is here on earth. It's not just in heaven. It is here. Salvation is God's work. And Jesus is initiating it from a place of strength. Rahil heard that voice in his left ear all his life. And after this encounter with Jesus at church, he writes this. My search was over. My desperate readings and meditations, my temple pilgrimages and rituals, my pujas and artis, they all added up to nothing compared to the manifest, tangible presence of Jesus Christ. They were all about doing to achieve some peace and find some internal transformation. Now, it had all been done without effort, just by his love. He had forgiven me, washed me clean, and given me new life. Jesus' follower Paul, he says, expressed it so clearly. It's by grace you've been saved, through faith, And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So we do not save people. Jesus saves people. And that's good news. So this call isn't a a call to do more. This talk isn't a call to do more. However, it's not an appropriate response either to say, okay, well, great, I'll just let God do it. 
I'm not needed. I'll just be kind to people and pray and hope they hear that voice speaking in their left ear. No, God wants people to be saved. God saves people, not us. But we have a role to play. We have a role to play. Rahil's story is heartbreaking in some respects. He spent 20 years of his life searching and not finding what he wanted. But whilst on his travels, he met Christians who radiated Jesus' presence. He read books written by Christians and he walked into an outward-looking, welcoming church as his search came to an end. And it was the same with my mate Mark. It was on the 12 Steps program that people talked to him about the higher power. They talked to him about God. And this led him to Jesus. For both of these men, with two very different stories, Christians played a key role. We have a role to play. So what is our role? I just want you to picture now for a minute your front line. That is the place where you are interacting with lots of people who aren't yet in a relationship with Jesus. It might be your football team, your netball team, your family, in your own workplace, your commute to work in the park, the school gate. Where is your front line? And just picture that now as you listen to verses 15 to 17 again. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what good life you live because you belong to Christ. So if we're worshipping Christ as Lord of our lives, in front of our friends, on our front lines, we will provoke their curiosity. Why are you living like that? What actually do you believe? And when they ask us these questions, we need to be ready (laughs) with a response. I was practicing this talk and I was talking to James about it a few days ago and he said, oh, I've just got this awful memory of the day after a a wedding. All my mates were there. We were at the pub. We'd ordered a a, a lunch, Sunday lunch. And my mate in front of everyone turned to me and said, James, what exactly is it that you believe? (laughs) And he said, I completely choked. (laughs) He said, I just stumbled over what to say. And I didn't have a response. And that has led James to always be ready, to get himself ready, so that the next time and the next time and the next time, he'll know exactly what to say. Verse 15, we could paraphrase it as this. Always be prepared to answer the question in a way that is true to you and appropriate to the person who is asking you the question. So it may have an intellectual element to it. Perhaps you've found that Jesus has answered your intellectual questions Or it may have more of a personal element to it. Is there a specific time in your life when you have known God to have heard your prayer and you've known there to be a wonderful answer? So I'm just going to do something slightly unconventional. I'm going to ask you that question now. Why do you follow Jesus? I just want you to think for a second about the answer because I'm going to ask you to share that with someone you don't know who is sitting near you. But while you're thinking, I'm going to give you my response to that question. I follow Jesus because it works. I can't think of a better explanation for everything in the universe than the one that the Bible gives. I pray to Jesus and he always answers my prayers, not always in the way that I want, at least not right away. And the love that I feel from God has convinced me that he is real and I would love for you to know that love too. Does that make sense? That's how I might give my story, give my answer. Always ending with a question to give them an opportunity to respond. So you've got one minute each. Turn to someone you don't know around you and answer that question. Why do you follow Jesus?
just one more minute, so swap over if you need to. Okay. Okay, can I ask you to turn, just to um, bring your conversations to a close now? Thank you. Shh. That's my teacher skills coming in. Thank you. I hope you found that really interesting and invigorating. So wonderful to tell each other our stories, isn't it? It's so exciting and it's really worth practicing telling our stories in a short, clear way, in a way that. Um, that really makes sense in a way that engages with the person we're speaking to. And don't forget, it's always good to end on a question, to put the ball back in their court and to give them a chance to respond. So the most important thing, point about this talk today is that we speak, is that we learn the importance of speaking about our faith. So share is my first point, share. And by this, I do mean speaking. Firstly, I've, I've, we've talked about how we might share our testimony, our personal story. But scripture is clear that there's something else that we need to share as well as our story. It's going right back to what we talked about at the beginning, that message of salvation. There are some people who believe that preaching is out of date and we should leave it to God. But that's not true, is it? The scripture says very clearly that we should speak and tell people the message that we believe. Romans 10. How then can they call on the, way, on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We need to speak the message of salvation. But how do we do that in a way that sounds normal, that doesn't sound weird? Again, we need to get used to practicing speaking about what Jesus has done in a way that we're comfortable with. And I've heard that one way of doing this Bible, at Bible College is that um, they practice by striking a match and learning to say the gospel, the message of salvation, and before that match has got down to their fingers so they can say it really quickly. So we're going to just try that. I hope the smoke alarm doesn't go off. I'm just going to try it now, okay? I'm really putting myself on the spot here. Okay, so here we go. Okay. I believe that God created the world and everything in it, except we haven't lived like that's true. We've lived for ourselves right from the start, and that separates us from God. And this selfishness is so ingrained in me that no matter how hard I try, I can never work myself back up to, ow! <laughs> I tried. Fortunately, I got the in-laws to bring in the extra long safety matches. <laughs> so I don't recommend that you use one of these. Use one of the big guns, okay? Let's go, we'll try again. I believe that we were all created by a perfect God. And that per... Oh! I'm glad you brought three. Let's try again. I believe we were all created by a perfect God. And that perfect God created a perfect world. But we have lived our own way, a way of selfishness. And that selfishness is so ingrained in me that no matter how hard I try, I can never work my way back to a perfect God. Thankfully, he sent Jesus, his son, to suffer and die on the cross in my place so that I can be forgiven and have a friendship with God, a friendship that lasts into eternity. Would you like that for yourself? Yeah. 
So that's my version of the good news. That's a way of saying it that I, find, I feel comfortable with. But it might be worth highlighting verse 18 in your Bible and have a go at rewriting it yourself in a way that you feel comfortable with sharing, in practicing it until it feels right, so that when you're sitting down at the dinner table and your friend turns around to you and says, mate, what exactly do you believe? You're ready to speak and you won't choke up. So that's the most important thing that we grasp today, is that we share. There's three really, really brief and quick ones to, that go with that, though. Share. We'll be helped in sharing if we also attend to prayer. So is there a person who you want to be praying for in your life? Perhaps you know straight away who that person is God has put on your heart to pray for. Maybe there's a few. But fasting for that person's salvation and praying for that person every day is really going to help uh, you get in that, in that mode of looking for an opportunity to share the gospel with them, but also God hears and answers prayer. You may have heard of D.L. Moody. You may have heard of that he prayed for 100 people to become Christians in his lifetime. And during his lifetime, 96 of them became Christians, and the other four became Christians at his funeral. I just love that story. I wonder who prayed for you. Share, prayer. Thirdly, care. Care. People don't care what you know until they know you care. Isn't that true? I just read this lovely quote from Simon Ponsonby in his book, Different. Do a kind act for someone each day, not to gain your brownie badge for helping an old person across the road, but to make someone's life flourish for a moment. I just love that. Helping someone open up about Christian things requires a kind of hospitable spirit, a desire to create a relationship where the other person feels safe. So if they felt loved by you, they're much more likely to open up. Share prayer, care, and lastly, bear. If we're going to step out, I just wanted to put care and bear together. (laughs) If we're going to step out and speak about Jesus, we have to be willing to suffer, to feel rejected, and also to endure gossip and slander. That just goes hand in hand. But there is no shame in that. I think this is something, I want to speak into this in our particular culture here in Cheltenham. There is something hugely shameful about rejection in our culture. I just want to say right now, and I want you to agree with me in your heart, there is no shame in being rejected for the gospel. It's the opposite, actually. Jesus was rejected for um, being God's son. And if we are going to be Christians, we should wear rejection like a badge. This isn't easy. You know, there's a, there's a woman at the school gate. My son's just started at reception. And there's a girl who I've known there since Gilbert was born. I've known her for four years. And I, and I feel blanked by her. Every time I see her, I say hello. I, I use her Christian name. And I get either a quick hello or she, I can see, she sees me and she looks the other way. And it hurts every time. I feel rubbish. But I have to remind myself that she knows I'm a Christian. She has chosen to withdraw herself. And I need to love her enough to keep on offering friendship, keep on offering kindness, keep on praying for her and love her because um, I have the saviour. I have the saviour. I can get over that. I can learn to live with rejection. So share prayer, care and bear. Just to finish... The summer I graduated, I was in South Africa, a tiny little place called Ladysmith in the rural interior, and I was staying at my friend's aunt and uncle's house, and they were were huge academics, they worked at the university, and they were humanists. And you probably know what a humanist is. A humanist believes that humanity are the highest intelligence and the highest authority. So you can imagine there wasn't really an opportunity to uh, share my faith naturally at the dinner table. And I was okay with that, actually. (laughs) I was praying for them. But one night, um, in the deepest dark, dark, because it was pitch dark in, in that place, I had this horrible dream, a dream that I believe came straight from God. And in the dream, there were two lines, and I could see it was judgment day. There was fire, it was dark, it was really scary. And as I looked across at the other line, I saw this whole family in that line. And I knew in the dream that my line was leading to heaven. Jesus was in this line. It's a line of light. But that the other line was not leading to heaven. It was leading to separation from God. 
And as I looked across and saw this family we were staying with, the mother of the family looked across at me, looked me in the eye and said, you stayed in our house and you ate our food and you never told me. And I woke up in just feeling horrible. I woke up feeling hugely scared. <laughs> and I got on my knees and I was just like, Lord, give me an opportunity to tell them. You know, I was going to tell them after that. I did not want that on my conscience. And do you know what happened? I told them. And I was, I was shunned. I was rejected. I was ridiculed slightly. But the 13-year-old daughter came up to me and said, I'm really interested in what you said. So I left her my Bible and my Bible notes. And I don't know where she is today with God. But I believe and I trust and I hope that there is a shining light in that family through whom all of that family might be in this line might be saved. This is too important just to put on the back burner because we've got busy lives. I'm saying this to myself. It's too important just to do the other three, do the, the praying and the caring and the bearing, but not actually sharing, not actually speaking. So I just wonder if you'd be willing to join with me today and ask God to give you opportunities to speak. Let's stand.